Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about the last of our NAT types, which is PAT, Port Address Translation. This allows the same IP address to be reused multiple times for translations. So with standard dynamic NAT that you saw in the last lecture, the inside hosts are translated to public IP addresses on a first come, first serve basis when they send traffic out. That requires a public IP address for every inside host which communicates with the outside network. When all the addresses in the pool have been used, new outbound connections from other inside hosts are going to fail because there's no addresses left to translate them to. We've already used up all of the addresses in our pool. Port Address Translation, or PAT, is an extension to NAP that permits multiple devices to be mapped to a single public IP address. So this is the solution to that problem. With PAT, you don't need a public IP address for every inside host. The router tracks translations by IP address and layer four port number as well. So typically for real world deployments, we're gonna need this because we're gonna have a lot more hosts on the inside with private IP addresses than we're gonna have public IP addresses on the outside available because those public IP addresses cost money. So we're gonna use PAT so that we can reuse them for multiple hosts on the inside. Because different inside hosts are assigned different port numbers when we use PAT, the router knows which host to send the return traffic to even when the public IP address is the same. So let's have a look at how this works in the lab. We're using the same lab topology again. I've got my hosts on the inside on the 10.0.2.0 slash 24 subnet. I don't need to use this for my internal server because I've got a permanent fixed static NAT translation for that. But on my normal PCs, I've got probably loads of PCs on the inside there and I don't have enough public IP addresses to give them all their own one. So I'm gonna use PAT so they can all get internet access at the same time. Dynamic NAT with overload uses PAT to allow more clients to be translated than IP addresses are available in the NAT pool. Dynamic NAT with overload is really just a type of PAT. It's not a different thing. If the NAT pool is, for example, 203.0.113.4 to 203.0.113.6, the first two hosts which initiate outbound connections will be translated to 203.0.113.4 for the first one and 203.0.113.5 for the second one. So exactly the same as standard dynamic NAT. Where it changes is when we get to the end of the NAT pool. The third host will be translated to 203.0.113.6 and the router will track which source port number was used in its translation table. The fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. hosts will also be translated to 203.0.113.6 because that's the highest address in the pool but they will use different source port numbers. When the return traffic is sent back, the router checks the destination port number to see which host to forward it to. So it's tracking based on IP address and port number. Because we've also got the port number, that allows us to differentiate between the different hosts that are using the same IP address. So let's walk through this with an example. So here we do have that pool of the three addresses, 203.0.113.4 to 203.0.113.6. And we've done our configuration. You'll see how to do the configuration coming up in a minute. So our first host on the inside, 10.10.10.10, it sends traffic out to a web server at 203.0.113.10. So it's going to a web server, so that's going to be the destination IP address and the destination port will be port 80. In our example, 
10.10.10.10 uses the source port number 49165. Whichever operating system is running on that host is going to choose a random source port number. So that's what it came up with in our example. When it goes through the router, it's going to match the NAT rule, so the router will NAT that traffic. And it's going to change the source IP address from 10.10.10.10 .10 .10 .10 .10 to 203.0.113.4. It's also changing the source port number here from 49165 to 4096. That traffic gets sent out to the web server and the web server sees it as coming from the NATed source of 203.0.113.4 and port number 4096. So the web server will send traffic back. It sends it to a destination IP address and port number of 203.0.113.4, 4096, the same place it came from. When that return traffic reaches the router, it's got a matching entry in the NAT translation table, so it knows to send that to 10.10.10.10, .10 .10 .10 port 49165. Then another host sends some traffic out to a web server. That comes from 10.10.10.11, .10 .10 port 49158 on the inside, the router nats it to 203.0.113.5 and source port number 4097. When the return traffic comes back from the web server, it's sent to a destination of 203.0.113.5 port 4097. The router sees it's got a matching translation in its NAT table, so it sends that on to 10.10.10.11 to .10 .10 .10 port 49158 where it originally came from. Then a third PC sends traffic out to the internet. That's 10.10.10.12, .10 .10 port number 49152. Notice that the first two hosts were translated to IP addresses 203.0.113.4 and 203.0.113.5, the first two addresses in our pool. This third host gets translated to the last IP address in our pool, which is 203.0.113.6, and its port number gets changed to 4098. You know the drill already. When the return traffic comes back from the server, it's sent to a destination of 203.0.113.6, port 4098, and the router knows to send that to 10.10.10.12, .10 .10 port 49152. Finally, Another host sends traffic out to a web server. It's 10.10.10.13, .10 .10 this time using source port 49152. The router nats it to 203.0.113.6, port 4099. We've already used up all the addresses in our NAT pool, and if we were using just standard NAT, this traffic would fail. But because we're using dynamic NAT with overload, which is a form of PAT, we can reuse that last IP address in the pool. So this host also gets translated to 203.0.113.6, that the router makes sure that it uses a different source port number this time. It uses 4099. So when the return traffic comes back from the server on the outside, it's going to a destination of 203.0.113.6, port 4099, the router knows that traffic for that IP address and port number pair needs to go to 10.10.10.13, .10 .10 port 49152, because it's got that matching entry in its NAT translation table. Okay, so that is how PAT works. How to actually configure it is a super similar configuration to what we did for our standard dynamic NAT. In fact, this slide here is showing the standard dynamic NAT configuration. So interface fast zero slash zero, that was facing out towards the internet. We configure that with IP NAT outside. Interface fast two slash zero was facing our host on the inside. We configure that with IP NAT inside. We configure the pool of global addresses, IP NAT pool, flat box, 203.0.113.4 to 203.0.113.6 with a net mask 255.255.255.240 in our example because that's a subnet mask on the outside interface. Then we create our access list to reference the inside hosts. Access list 1, permit 10.0.2.0, 0.0.0.255 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 and finally we tie the NAT pool and the access list together with IP NAT inside source list 1 pool flat box. So that's the same configuration 
that you saw in the last lab demo when we did the standard dynamic NAT configuration. This is the one with the problem where we're, we can only use however many IP addresses are in the pool. So the example here, dot four to dot six, so that's three addresses. Only three hosts are going to be able to get out at the same time. The fourth host is going to fail. How we can change this to being a PAT configuration, which will allow multiple hosts to reuse that top address in the pool is, drum roll, exactly the same configuration. We just put the keyword overload on the, at the end of the IP NAT inside source list one pool flat box config. So that command you see down at the bottom there, IP NAT inside source list one pool flat box, we just say overload at the end. Everything else, the configuration is exactly the same. So like I said before, for real world deployments, you're pretty much always going to be using the overload keyword you're almost always going to have more hosts in the inside than you've got IP addresses on the outside. You don't want to run out of addresses in your pool, so you will configure it with the overload keyword just like this. Okay, so that was how we do overload. The last thing to show you, so the last NAT scenario to cover is a small office which has not purchased a range of public IP addresses. In this case, the outside interface facing the internet will most likely get its IP address via DHCP from the service provider. So it's a small office. They do have internet connectivity, but they've only got a single IP address on the outside. They haven't bought a range of IP addresses. Usually in that case, you're not gonna have a single fixed IP address. You're gonna get your IP address from DHCP. And this gives us an issue for NAT because that DHCP address might change over time. The service provider won't guarantee that the IP address stays the same. So we can't specify a pool with a fixed IP address because it might work at first, but it'll stop working when the IP address changes that we get from the service provider. But it's okay, there is a solution for this. PAT can be used to allow multiple inside hosts to share a single outside public IP address, even when it's using DHCP. The configuration is very similar to dynamic NAT with overload, but it translates to the outside interface rather than a pool of addresses. So you must translate to the outside interface rather than a specific IP address, because like I just said, the DHCP address that you get from the provider might change. So our configuration for this, actually, just before I walk through this, let's look back at the previous one again. So when we had a pool, we specified the pool of addresses. Then we specified the access list, the hosts on the inside, and then we mapped them together. When we're using the outside interface rather than a pool, obviously, we're not going to have the first of those three commands. We're not going to have the pool configured. So let's look at this configuration now. So on interface fast zero slash zero facing the interface, I've got IP address DHCP there. I say IP NAT outside. Interface fast one slash zero, which is facing the inside hosts for this example, is IP NAT inside. The access list is configured exactly the same. Access list one permit 10.0.2.0, 0.0.255. .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 and then I say IP NAT inside source list one interface fast zero slash zero overload. So I'm not mapping the access list to a pool of addresses. I'm mapping it to the interface and it will automatically use the IP address that is configured on that interface. And I've configured the overload keyword at the end. So all of my hosts on the inside will be able to use that one public IP address on the outside. The router will be able to differentiate between them for returning traffic because it's going to have different port numbers being used. Okay, and how we actually verify this is the same command as usual, show IP NAT translation. And when I do this, you can see we've got the same output here, but we can see all of the port numbers that are being used there as well. So that's how the router knows which traffic is for what. Okay, that was it for Pat. See you in the next lecture where we'll do a lab demo. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free 
right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.